Before he was arrested last year, uh, Joaquin El Chapo, which means kind of shorty, because he was short, uh, Guzman, before he was arrested last year, he had, uh, he would reportedly show up to restaurants in the city of Mazatlan, in the state of Sinaloa. He was the head of the Sinaloa cartel, and he was the most wanted man um, in Mexico, and also public enemy number one uh, in the United States. There was a $5 million reward for him. But he would show up in restaurants in Mazatlan unannounced. His bodyguards would come in and collect everyone's cell phones so they wouldn't report that he was there. He would eat, <clears throat> and then he would pay the bill for everyone in the restaurant. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something that may not make me popular, but it's not because I'm worried about you calling that I'm here. But I'm going to ask you to put away your cell phones. And I'm going to ask that you also put away or close your computer tops. I'm going to be talking about neuroscience and cognitive cultural studies. And research shows that a distracted mind is an unhappy mind that when you're trying to do more than one thing at a time, thinking about something other than what you are doing, you are unhappy. And humans have this incredible ability, but it comes at an emotional cost. Now, I don't know how many of you have actually been up here, but it's quite easy to see who is still on the phone and texting, and who still has a computer open. Now, I know uh, I ask students um, if they're going to take notes in classes that I teach to, to let me know, and some of you will. Um, but I want you to spend the next 40 minutes that you've given yourselves permission uh, to be here. Nothing else is scheduled. Nobody's looking for you. Uh, you don't have any work commitments or seminars to attend. But really just listen to me. Because that's really difficult. I'm going to try to organize this in about 10 minute chunks so that there might be a little momentary break. But if you want to write, that's fine. But listening would be adequate. Okay? Now, I probably won't win the most popular uh, uh, presenter award, but I don't care. Oh, maybe I'll get the worst one if there's the least popular. Uh, now, um, I'm excited about neuroscience, and it seems perhaps an odd choice for a historian. Um, but I'm even excited because such ordinary things that we do with our lives, a full third of our lives are spent sleeping. And new research has shown that the process of sleeping, the act of sleeping, is actually a very busy time for our brains, not because we're dreaming, but because our brains are using a mechanism, a, the, a, a, like a lymphatic system, to clear the brain of clutter. It allows us to form memories the next day, uh, to form short-term memories about experiences, to recall the habits of our bodies that we use to move through the world. Uh, that's already two sort of cognitive studies that I've talked about. And I'll try to uh, introduce as many as I can. Uh, let's see, I'll come back to that. I don't want anyone to go to sleep, though. No, I guess that's what I was thinking. Uh, there's a crisis in the study of humanities in universities across the world. And this crisis is particularly acute in countries where the cost of higher education has been privatized and where families are forced to make enormous investments in tuition books, housing, as well as the opportunity costs of studying instead of working. In the United States, where only 30% of the adult population has earned a four-year degree, higher education has become a form of job training. Parents and friends ask, what we do with a degree in literature or anthropology or art or dance or history? And university administrators tout engineering, medical, and agricultural discoveries 
that are then turned into patent protected income generating enterprises. Too many university administrators, state legislators, and students see the liberal arts as a luxury with limited tangible benefits. With the exception of elite private universities in the US, my own field of history has experienced this demise. Over the past 10 years, in many universities, undergraduate enrollments in history courses have declined by half, and graduate programs for the PhD have been cut in half. Uh, this talk is about the perspective offered by historical inquiry. I want to make the case that studying the past is not superfluous to our rapidly changing lives. On the contrary, in a world where time scales have collapsed, where 10 years in either direction seems like a long time, historical consciousness is more important than ever. Now, a part of the challenge is that many people believe the past is over and done, irretrievable and therefore trivial. Just a set of dates attached to so-called facts about old white men. If youth in the Balkans or elsewhere are apathetic or not as political as their parents, then they are also less historical. One problem is that too many of us live in an eternal present, a present moment that never ends, and that has collapsed time so that the past is over and done and the future is rushing towards us faster than we can comprehend. According to Paul Connerton and How Modernities Forget, the skill valued most now is not the ability to gather information, which, which any child can do on a computer, the important skill now is the ability to discard information quickly and then set it aside and move on to the next bit of infotainment. I call that uh, process instant information gratification, which has become something of a digital or virtual form of solipsism, the self-centered epistemological trap that the only certain knowledge exists in the individual's mind and the only real experience is that of the individual. We also experience anxiety about the fear of not knowing what is happening. What are the latest stories, the gossip, the scandals, the crises, the natural disasters, and the acts of human violence? Now, it's, it's always easy to blame young people uh, for not valuing the past, and I, I know it makes me sound old. Uh, but a major part of the challenge I want to examine must also be addressed to those of us who work as professional historians who have failed to uh, reconsider how we work, how we write, how we interact with colleagues in the universities, and how we interact with students in the classroom. History is just too often plain boring or esoteric or abstract. And we have to find a new way to make the case for the importance of thinking historically in the present. I do this, I do history, I, I, I read books, I talk, because I enjoy it. I have a good time. Hell, uh, something that bores me is death. And unless we embrace that play, we're kidding ourselves that uh, we would even value it, so why should someone else? I'll be arguing here that neuroscience and cognitive studies can help historians make meaning out of the past, and make an effective case for the relevance of historical consciousness in the present. I'll first talk about memory and cognitive studies, and then turn to applying an understanding of the psychology of violence to uh, the case of the war on drugs and mass migration around a neoliberal globalized world. There are only three parts, and although I haven't really timed this out, I'm hoping that you can uh, stay with me uh, through each of those. So, the ability to think historically should be easy, uh, since we are all aware of our own autobiographical histories. It is within the memories of our past, the intangible record of the experiences and skills we have acquired that we have, that we, and that we have found meaningful, 
that we can begin to see the importance of historical consciousness. Memories are always meaningful, or else they would not be memories. In fact, the title of my talk, Memory is the Mother of History, comes from this ancient idea. Namosene was the mother of Cleo, the muse of history. She was also the mother of eight other muses, each of those in some ways tied to the arts and the sciences. I set out many years ago to read as much as I could about memory. Um, and when I realized I didn't have enough time in this world or to read it all or the ability to remember it, which is something of a memory joke, I hired people to help me read this material. But now I've become somewhat discouraged, maybe even uh, cynical about memory studies. Seeing the field as something of a black hole that sucks in pages and pages of writing that never ends and that continues to grow beyond my comprehension or ability to master. The study of memory creates a, a powerful gravitational pull for scholars interested in reminding the public of past failures, atrocities, and human rights violations. Memory studies, and I think we should begin capitalizing that as a proper noun, both memory and studies, appears to be theoretically rich, complicated, and useful for explaining the interaction between the past and the present. But I would suggest that the promise of memory studies is misleading, un engaño, a uh, deception. And its usefulness for understanding the tension between remembering and forgetting, or between the individual and the collective, is more of an issue of never having known about past events. Ignorance rather than forgetfulness. Historians, like me, uh, who teach at all levels of education, we rely on this ignorance to justify our careers. And politicians rely on this ignorance to insert their own versions of the past into visions and plots of the present. The other pitfall of memory comes from the fact that by far most of studies on memory in the humanities and social sciences deal with social memory or collective memory and emphasize the struggle between an official uh, history and a popular memory. Uh, this work draws primarily on Maurice Halbach's 1925 publication on collective memory. But my concern is that scholars have substituted the word memory as a poor but accessible metaphor for history or historical consciousness. I collect memory metaphors, and this is a small sample of some of those I've collected. There are 46 of them up here, uh, some of them with uh, references. All of these, uh, a dozen or more, uh, come from one, one scholar's work on memory. Um, I particularly like the dirty memory. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Well, I know what it means. It means a kind of clouded memory. But I think it means a memory of dirty things. Maybe. Um, but where do we, how do we make meaning out of all of these things? What is uh, a memory box versus a memory knot versus memory projects? memory truths, or what's the difference between a collective memory or a successful collective memory or a failed collective memory? What's a failed collective memory? None of this ultimately makes sense. They, all of these metaphors offer compelling insight into how memories are shared, but they provide no guidance into the ways in which memories are actually formed and then recalled through the cognitive processes of the individual mind-body. As long as we cling to the idea that memories exist as objects in a social collective context, we will only be adding new metaphors to this list. We are engaged then not in trying to understand the interaction between the past and the present, but we're engaged in our own literary practices of creativity and originality. This issue is exactly what has plagued uh, the jargon field uh, the jargon-filled cultural history of the past decade or two. It's created too many requirements for meta-representational tagging, external tagging, sourcing the author rather than the information or the analysis. Um, 
Now, I'm not, a, I'm not against the, uh, the process of narrative within memories. In fact, the dramaturgy, uh, dramaturgy explains how memories become ordered through language, through the narrative voice that translates experiences into words or animates experience onto the stage where an audience, even if just one person, a grandchild, a lover, an ethnographer, accepts the narrative as true. But the events ordered by memory happened in a present moment that lacked its own coherence. The dramaturgical function reshapes memories into stories that have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And people do not necessarily invent their memories, but they come to structure them in a temporal or chronological narrative that's necessarily rescripted in order for the audience or the listener to be able to understand the meaning of the mystery of the memory. Meanings become possible in this process, and without it, they would be like dreams, random, incomplete, and confusing. The notion of uh, collective memory ultimately describes a behaviorist interpretation of how people act. And I'm arguing today we need to move into the cognitive world, which began in medical science uh, and cognitive science more than 50 years ago. Prior to the cognitive revolution, psychologists answered why questions with appeals to function, because it helps the rat find food, or motivations, because the rat is hungry, or reinforcement, because the rat was rewarded last time. Behaviorists argued that, psycho that psychology should only concern itself with that which could be observed. And behaviorism, in that sense, becomes a little bit like what's called the McNamara fallacy, which is about Robert McNamara, not me, who was Secretary of State during the Vietnam War uh, fought by the United States in Vietnam, who argued that the only thing that really mattered were those things you could count. He only wanted to know death counts, body counts, how many soldiers fought today, how many bullets were fired. It's wrong and misleading. The internal workings of the brain and the mind were not important to behaviorists. But behavior science offers an inadequate explanation for human action because it too often relies on observing external actions motivated or animated by observable triggers or nudges. We're going to, this is going to become the trope, I think. Right, Roberta? Nudges. Um, or really the more precise term, which is choice architecture. The field of cognitive science, however, examines how the brain generates meaning, which actually leads to action. Now, the trick is here that I'm arguing um, that the turn that I want to make is to acknowledge that how the brain works today is consistent with how it worked in the past. The modern human brain and its ability to create meaning through mind and body experiences is actually not that old in terms of evolutionary time. And here, um, I put up a chart. This is what's referred to as big history, which talks about uh, the history of the universe, and in particular, the history of the Earth. Not of the world, but of the Earth. The Earth is over four and a half billion years old. Primates emerged on Earth 85 million years ago which is only 1.9% of the entire Earth's time. Modern humans, with the larger frontal lobe and the ability to reason and make meaning, diverted from archaic homo sapiens only 200,000 years ago, which is uh, four, ten, four one thousandth of 1%. You can't even see the blue line on this chart. I can't blow it up large enough for you to see. It puts into context the idea of evolutionary biology. It erases, and this is its uh, a critique against big history, it erases culture and specificity and the assumption that we're all different and, indi and individuals. Instead, it calls for looking for a common human uh, essence, if you will. Um, now, I've also. What happened to? Yeah, the batteries are gone. What? Batteries, batteries are what? 
time has disappeared. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, I, I, don't, I don't have it up here, and I don't want to start any arguments. But what's revealing about this is when we think of, about world religions as well, which for so many people drives their motivation and helps them make sense of the world, the dominant religions are actually quite young, even in terms of modern human history, with some older forms of Hinduism going back perhaps 30,000 years ago, but most world religions having their origins in, um, as old 3,500 years ago, or Christianity 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago is 1% of modern human time. What, uh, what do we do with the other 99%? For all that has been written about memory over the past, uh, or the last 100 years, well, I'm enjoying these slides that I've prepared. Um, <laughs> um, I find myself going back to Henri Bergson's Matter and Memory, published originally in 1896. In fact, by incorporating the recent work of neuroscientists I would argue that research into memory formation has nearly come full circle. Back to Bergson's original insights. He argued that memories need for their actualization a motor ally, and that they require for their recall a kind of mental attitude which must itself be engrafted upon the body. If such be the case, he says, then verbs, which essentially express imitable actions, are precisely the words in, uh, that we should be used to, be, to describe memory. For many uh, years, it's, I can't teach with that. I can't talk even. I, I can't even without a PowerPoint. But anyway, uh, for many years, these ideas about memory remain somewhat consistent with the work of neuroscientists. Um, Eric Kandel, for example, used his own metaphor to talk about how memories are like ink on paper. In the short term, they can be smudged. But after they dry, after they're consolidated, they become stable and fixed. But new research in neuroscience reveals that memories are themselves reorganized. New synaptic connections are formed in the act of recall. Nader, uh, Kamir Nader, a neuroscientist working now in Canada, posits that memories are actually changed in the recall process. Reconsolidation, he says, takes place then through a process of recall. The implications of this new research should guide the way historians and other scholars write about memory formation. For example, if we take Steve Stern's idea that Chileans guard their memories in a box that sits in the living room and only occasionally take out those memories of uh, life under the Pinochet dictatorship. The Nader's research suggests that Chileans may actually be recalling not the original experiences, but the memory of having previously shared that memory with others. The memories then put back into the box are changed this makes it problematic to think of memories as simply objects. This research has helped me think about memory as a doing, not as a thing, as a verb, and not as a noun. Um, and in that sense, I use the concept of, in my work, of what I call commemorative practice. And I have this really cool PowerPoint generated diagram <laughs> that <laughs> had, is coming. That deals with, that suggests that there's a moment of historical reflection that's followed by the actual rituals of commemoration, um, and the past being, according to Bergson, that which no longer acts. And through these rituals of commemoration, especially the body moving in time and space, there, there emerges a new consciousness of the present, a new understanding of the present. And it's that consciousness then that will lead to a new action, or if you will, uh, a revolution. Oh, well, see, it's not as complicated as I was describing, but I liked it. Okay. Um, 
treating collective memories as contingent or uh, and history as unified or consensual misrepresents the past and the work of historians. And this is an unnecessary tension, really, between history and memory. In this case, professional history is actually quite recent, emerging from the 19th century, whereas memory is ancient and human. History is for professionals. Anyone, um, every human has access to memory. It's popular. History is still, at times, makes claims of objectivity that are misguided and naive. But it's also the fact that people, other people who are not historians assign that objective truth claim to historical texts uh, independently. Memories are uh, true or authentic. You can't call into question someone's memory. But yet they're unreliable. Both of them are narrative, one in particular around writing and the other usually in some form of sharing. Um, what, what is problematic here is that historians, oh, I know, there's this word. The challenge for historians and non-historians is to really begin with the idea that the past has no inherent meaning. The, the trick word there is inherent. Historians do not discover a singular lesson about the past, reveal that lesson in their writing, and then move on to the next chapter. Rather, historians impose their own meaning on the past and their own interpretations of the cause and effects of events that certainly happened, which we can call facts, I guess, but may have happened for reasons historians do not fully realize or can only partially explain. Uh, we should acknowledge then, as historical anthropologist Greg Denning argued, that history is a metaphor of the past. History is not the past. The same interaction between the past and the present that we identify with memory takes place within historical analysis, though professional historians often try to conceal this interaction. Instead, history becomes the practice of retelling the past from the perspective of the past, which is different from memory, which comes to us uh, into the present. Um, the memory studies universe continues to expand, while history, or perhaps history with a capital H, contracts around a narrow methodological debate dealing with source material and the usefulness of incorporating is interdisciplinary theory into our versions of the past. And here, the um, Italian novelist and semiologist, brilliant thinker of our time, Umberto Eco, has captured this idea of the, uh, the changing ways in which memories are uh, reorganized through recall. Okay. Well, now I'm going to get into some, uh, as I if history is guided, I'm going to talk about the, the um, drug violence. And I'm going to show a clip from Scarface. <laughs> no. <laughs> so Scarface, um, originally, uh, Scarface subtitled The Shame of the Nation, was originally produced by Howard Hughes uh, in 1932. It was loosely based on the rise and fall of Al Capone during the era of alcohol prohibition in the US. And of course, prohibition failed miserably. More people drank than ever before, particularly women. More people became addicted to alcohol. More people died from al uh, adulterated alcohol. More people broke the law. And the government's authority began to erode in other areas. And more people became wealthy from the illegal black market. If history had guided policymakers, then President Richard Nixon's declaration of a war on drugs in 1972 never would have happened. But this war is America's longest war, and it's been losing this war, and it cannot win this war. Instead, the moral obsession of trying to control behavior, particularly the behavior of African American, Latino, and Asian men, has led to mass incarceration in the United States and mass violence in other parts of the world. Hollywood films about illicit drugs and violence are parody 
and not at all realistic, including, of course, Brian De Palma's 1983 remake of Scarface. In this case, Italians like Al Pacino play Latinos, and the predictable tropes of rags to riches to death plays out as Greek tragedy, complete with the temple columns supporting the mansion for the final shootout and hungry tigers waiting to eat sacrificial enemies. Cocaine film in popular culture, or stories in popular culture, always end in destruction, while films about marijuana simply lead to giggling reminiscences about high times and end at White Castle or Quick Trip to satisfy the inevitable munchies. But the reality is much more grim. Nearly 750,000 people were arrested for marijuana possession in the United States in 2012. There are two million people in US prisons. Half are in jail for nonviolent drug offenses. And yet, the question that's most often asked in the United States is, why is Mexico so violent? Why are Mexicans so violent? Uh, now, Hollywood can't get this right because it would, they have to meet an aesthetic expectation that audiences will, will find pleasurable. To depict the real violence would be to show the unesthetic, the inesthetic, the ugly, which would force people to uh, turn away. Cognition creates new opportunities, though, for explaining how theories of mind and ideas about humanness and human nature help us to explain what's really going on. Um, in this case, Mexico, uh, before 2006, did not have a drug problem. The United States did. And Mexico was not violent. It couldn't, Mexicans did not have guns. There's one gun store in Mexico City for the entire country where you can legally buy a gun. The city itself is 20 million people. 90% of the guns used in this violent war come from the United States. And yet, we ask, why are Mexicans so violent? The money that buys this comes from drug demand in the United States. For human rights advocates working in Mexico, uh, we should also ask about the psychological effects of witnessing or reading about acts of incomprehensible terror. Incomprehensible terror. In effect, I would argue that the perpetrators of human rights violations, whether they are uh, agents of the state, narco sicarios, uh, narco assassins, or human traffickers, are experts at mind reading. They rely on what are called mere neurons to convey the anguish of seeing a body without a head or a head without a body. And they know our emotions uh, um, and minds will be touched when we hear gunshots in the distance, when we see one of their armored-plated uh, trucks driving through the village. They'll understand how we react when they kill an elected official, or even worse, as they've begun doing, killing relatively anonymous individual bloggers. Thus, I see cognitive studies as a way to humanize the perpetrators of violence in Mexico. And by that, I mean to place the context of violence, the explanations for violence, not in a realm where people who commit these horrible acts are described as monsters, but as part of the human, uh, human family. We've too easily considered their acts inhumane and too quickly distanced our, ourselves from a sense of humanity. It's what we have done with Nazis, and I'll, I'll use the word Nazis rather than Germans. The Germans dehumanized the Jewish people and others, and killed them with uh, astounding technological efficiency. We have dehumanized the Nazis. We've distanced ourselves from their acts by saying, we are not like they are. They are monsters, inhuman. And this was the point of memory studies from the very beginning and genocide studies, is to say this would never happen again. And yet how many acts of genocide and ethnic cleansing have taken place since the end of World War II? Um, the war in Mexico is what, uh, the drug war is what I'd call Mexico's Vietnam. It's a proxy war fought there in order uh, to, uh, at the request of the United States. 
The goal in Vietnam or the, the object was to dehumanize the enemy who were godless communists, although now reliable free trade partners. Um, and the uh, violence, the people who commit violence in Mexico are insane monsters. Casualties are quite different, however. Mexico's drug war since 2006 has been more violent in terms of casualties than the US war in Vietnam was for US soldiers. There were approximately a million Vietnamese killed. But if we look at this, and there were 58,000 troops killed over 20 years in the United States, which at the time represented about 0.03% of the population. Now Mexico has lost 10% of its population, or I mean 0.10% of its population. 130,000. If the same percentage would have been lost in the United States when public outcry became so great that the war had to end and it was clear that it couldn't be won, there would have been something like 300,000 US troops killed. There are flawed strategies that characterize both the US war in Vietnam and this war in, uh, in Mexico. The strategy is to treat these drugs as an insurgent, as an insurgency. Cut off the leadership, arrest them like Chapo Guzman, and these enterprises will end. But they're businesses. They'll continue because there's too much money involved. And these are unwinnable wars. It was in Vietnam, and it is in uh, the war against drugs in uh, Mexico and around the world. I like this image because it depicts exactly what I think is happening. This is from 2010 when Mexico celebrated its bicentennial of independence in a large military parade on September 16th that took hours to, to go by my hotel. I just I couldn't believe it. I would come away, I couldn't believe they're still marching. They're still, just goes, but you see here these troops with rockets provided by US military aid. And they're showing off that this technology of war, but underneath the headline says, drug consumption increases in the United States without making this connection. In the United States, this violence has continued so to the point we have mass incarceration. Down here on the bottom, we see that uh, over 2 million people are in US prisons. More people as a net number than are in prison in China, which has a population three times the size of the United States. The highest. Uh, rate per 100,000 in the world at 698. What's interesting though is our capacity is really, we built prisons for this. We've handled this. Uh, as I said, over half of the people here in prison here are in jail or in prison for nonviolent drug offenses. And overrepresented in that population in particular African-American men who do not use or sell drugs in any greater number than whites and yet are eight times overrepresented in prisons. This war, uh, like the war in Vietnam, has, ex has expanded and involved other, uh, destabilized other countries. And now tens of thousands of migrants from Central America, particularly from El Salvador and Honduras, are trying to find safe haven in the United States. El Salvador has a prison population of over 28,000, but their occupancy rate is 337%. People are housed like animals. And perhaps that's the message we want to give them, or the, the Salvadoran government, that they are animals. But then they'll act like animals. These are phones they collect. They can't keep cell phones out. These are women in El Salvador. Um, okay, so I'm about done, I think, or how much time do I have? About done, all right. All right, so the last question is, or thing I want to focus on is this um, neoliberal globalized world. What we see in this, um, in this context is that we're no longer citizens of our separate nations, but yet we're defined by national stereotypes. We have become global consumers. The history of nation states suggests that instead of being mobilized as political actors, we are now being mobilized as consumers. In the, when 
ethnic minorities and women and new immigrants and emancipated slaves were arguing for citizenship rights. They did so with a political consciousness. And instead now uh, we deal with a, a world in which we're supposedly united on trade issues, or at least most of the leaders of our countries act as if they are united and deaf to protest and criticism. A new orthodoxy of politicians and economists has emerged from the early years of privatization to reduce tariffs, supposedly create jobs, reduce prices for consumers, and all economies will grow. But we know from more than 50 years of assembly plant production, which began in Mexico in 1964, that these jobs offer low salaries that fail to create a new consumer class that can even purchase the goods that they're making in the sweatshops. Nation states maintain sovereignty only when it comes to their problems. We have given economic decision making over to multinational corporations and arbitration boards of trade alliances. And in the United States, corporations now have free speech rights and religious rights on a par with the individual. Economic inequality is not simply the natural outcome of some invisible hand, and ec but economic inequality within and between countries contributes to uh, these massive problems. We remain ever more isolated in our separate societies. The problems are for individuals, uh, individual countries to confront. Are we going to uh, only work together for profit? but not share the costs of resolving these deep problems, seeing the need to globalize economies, but balkanize the expensive solutions to resolving our challenges. Uh, Paul Connerton talks about this as well, where the human signature behind the goods we live with are um, detached. And there's a certain irony, tomorrow we'll hear about aging, and some of you have been studying that. But there's a, there's a paradox, as life expectancies have increased, the life of the objects we live with have decreased, moving rapidly. It gives this sense, as I said, that time moves quickly, that 10 years is, is far. Uh, this is less, pretty much less. But how, uh, how many of you, if you think about the last 10 years, now if you're 20, you were 10. If you're 50, you were 40. But how much have you changed in the last 10 years? Would you say a lot? Would you think you've changed a lot? Now, how much are you, do you think you're going to change in the next 10 years? What happens when this is actually studied instead of just um, asked generally like this, is that people are relatively happy or believe that the person they are today is who they'll be in 10 years. We're remarkably unprepared to imagine a future that meets the reality. This is part of a, um, the illusion that we won't change anymore in the next 10 years, or won't be as much. Uh, and part of that is because, as I said, this, this uh, rapidly uh, evolving information world and of technology in particular. So this is the last thing. Since World War II, memory has become privileged and always true and counter-hegemonic, but history has written official narratives and made all, uh, which has made ill-advised and naive truth claims. Historians created our own disciplinary boundaries and we've protected ourselves from facing the epistemological challenge that transformed anthropology in the 1980s and 90s. Like the rest of us, historians should not let the opportunity to join the world of cognition so easily pass us by. Thanks. <laughs>